to this webinar, which is part of our monthly webinar series at MAB, the Muslim Association of Britain, which uh, is an organization that was founded in 1997. And we are dedicated to serving society um, and leading Muslim grassroots contributions. Every month we aim to bring you a new topic and new speakers so we can all benefit. And in this month's installment, we're gonna be hearing from prominent activists in our community who will share with us their experiences. And today we're gonna to be working under the banner of local action, global impact, inshallah. What we hope to do is to explore how we as Muslims can create effective and meaningful change in our society through an Islamic foundation. And the speakers that will be with us today are uh, Sister Govan Rashid. Govan is the head of campaigns at the Muslim Association of Britain Youth Branch uh, or Youth Department, so MABI. She's very passionate about youth work and any work that will aid the betterment of society. And she's currently a master's student studying for her MSc in stem cell and regenerative medicine. We also have with us today uh, Brother Omar Salha. Omar is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. He's a lecturer in international diplomacy and soft power. He's a PhD in the Hood Scholar at SOAS University of London and the founder and director of the Ramadan Tent Project, RTP. The Ramadan Tent Project was launched in 2013 and it's a social enterprise dedicated to serving the youth and wider community through open spaces of spirituality, dialogue and empowerment. RTP has organised and continues to organise the world's first community-led public iftar campaign called, uh, called Open Iftar. Um, and what it does, it invites people of all faiths and no faith to uh, break their faiths together and explore the Islamic faith and to share the community spirit through food, international uh, inspirational talks and engaging discussions. Today, Open Iftar has hosted over 50,000 guests across seven cities and four continents. One of those cities was Manchester, which I attended a couple of years ago. And I can definitely tell you that the, the environment and the community spirit is, is very vibrant, mashallah. We are also very lucky to have with us today, Dr. Hani Benna, who comes from a medical background, but he's found his calling in community and humanitarian work. He's the founder and president of the Humanitarian Forum, which seeks to build bridges between Muslim and non-Muslim NGOs worldwide. He's also the co-founder uh, and former president of Islamic Relief Worldwide and International Relief and Development Charity Organization which is familiar to many, and his humanitarian activities span over, mashallah, 30 strong years through which he's shown his commitment to interfaith dialogue, community work, and youth work. So without further ado, inshallah, we'll hand over to Dr. Herney, who is going to tell us a little bit about his experiences and the lessons that we can extract today from his experiences over the last 30 years, and explain to us how we can create meaningful change. So over to you, Dr. Herney, Jazakallah. Alhamdulillah, thank you very much, uh, Sister Bushra, Sister Govan, Brother Omar, and Sister Yasmin, for inviting me to this meeting today. It's very important for me because whenever uh, a youth meeting is organized, I am ready to go and learn and listen to them. Today, in my first interaction, I will talk about uh, threats and warning for the young people, particularly knowing that I'm talking to people who are young, energetic, zealous, and have the drive and have the energy, and they would like to do things for tomorrow, yesterday. My warning is a few. That's why I'm starting with them. Then we can go to other points. First warning or red card that if we do not, if we do not, if we do not know our history, it is not a must, it is a compelling duty that each and every one of us must know his or her history, the history of his or her ummah, the history of the way Islam has been built within the community to serve the community, to save the community, and to drive the community, and to make the community bring it out from the middle of the desert of no man's land to be the champion of civilization in the whole world and leading humanity. If we don't know our history and see my finger when I point with it like this, I'm just threatening each and every one. You will never be able to be understanding the contemporary life around you 
then to take this to the future. People who do not know the history, as how it has been made before, will never be able to create the future for others and create the, the history for the future generation. This is number one. It's a fatal mistake. It's a fatal mistake. It's a fatal mistake. Number two, in a way, Arabic language is the top, uncomparable to any other language on earth. And this is something most of the great scholars of Islam were not Arabs, but their mothers like you, Sister Govan, Sister Bushra, and Sister uh, Yasmin insisted that their children have been born in Central Asia from uh, Afghanistan, what we call it now, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and, and, and Iran, and, 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 to learn and master the Arabic language and to be the master of humanity in this subject. Arabic language, in a very, in a very uh, frank way, cannot be compared to any other language because the proverbs and the metaphor of it is standing, shining high above any other language. I'm not saying don't actually learn other languages, but master the Arabic language, particularly if you want to call yourself sheikh or imam or ustaz. And this is something that my third red card, my first red card is history. My second red card is the Arabic language. My third red card is calling ourselves names which are not qualified for it. And I remember a discussion by Sheikh Rahmatullahi Muhammad Al Ghazali in Egypt. And this discussion was about nearly 60 years ago. And he was saying, young men and young women, especially men, and reading one or two books, and they call themselves ulama. On what ground? On what basis? Somebody, maybe 20 years ago, was trying to call me ustaz. I said, you cannot call me ustaz, because I am not ustaz. Ustaziyya, it means prof professorship of knowledge, mastership of experience, and interaction and direction. So please don't, don't, don't call yourself these names because it's deceiving more than directing. And this is my third red card. And my fourth red card is not, and this was my fight with the young Muslim groups in the 80s, is not respecting the elderly who do, who does, who do not speak the English language. Our parents and our grandparents. I hope this culture is changing nowadays. So my four red cards for us is on the table. If any one of us playing football and supporting, uh, I think Liverpool is playing now, isn't it? I think, I don't know. I don't know what to know the score because I'm not in the, in the football uh, thingy. Actually, if anyone does something wrong in the match, the referee will give him a red card. That means you are out. Four red cards for me today. This is my first warning. My second thing is our experience, as Sister Bush was talking about. I'm very happy to be shadowed, or to be shadowing. Sorry, I'm not saying to be shadowed, but to be shadowing Sister Govan and Brother uh, uh, Homer Salha, I used to work under him a long time ago, actually, and learn from him a lot. And uh, we started in the 80s, creating what we call it nowadays, humanitarian movement. 1984 was the birth of Muslim humanitarian movement in the whole West. Alhamdulillah, before that, it was a Palestinian issue. Only it was some representative for Afghanistan to represent Afghan community to raise funds for Afghanistan. 
and some other issues on unorganized way. But the first re real response was in 1984, when we started the Islamic Caliph, 1985, when Muslim aid came out, and then now, alhamdulillah, we succeeded to create a movement which has more than 100 international Muslim humanitarian organization in the country. But 84, we had one. Now, we passed the 100. 84, we did not have budget. Now, our budget in hundreds of millions of pounds, only from UK. And you did it through your parents who supported us and your grandparents who support us. Building a humanitarian movement is extremely easy because we play on the nerves and the emotion of people. So we succeeded and we are succeeding. In 2005, we started, or before 2005, we started talking about social movement, especially we declared this after 5 5 when we were in the uh, in the Lord's Ma Lord Mayor office, uh, Ken Livingston, we were donating, Islamic was donating half a million dollars for the ambulances for London Mayor uh, project at that time. I said, we, suck, we said, not I said, sorry, sorry to say, I, to use the word I. You know, you listen to me, Bushra, sorry to say the word I. Okay. We said, we succeeded of creating humanitarian movement now we have to create social movement. What do you mean by social movement? It is to respond to the needs of every individual in our community, the blind, the disabled, the elderly, the displaced, the homeless, the widows, the dogs for the blind people, the deaf, everyone. And this was the second movement which we should create and it's your role now. And this started in 2005 to declare it publicly. And we're still fighting. COVID is one of the responses. The flooding everywhere in UK and in Europe. It's not only home, sweet home, where my mother and father came from, Africa or Asia or Latin America or, or, or. No, it is also charity starts at home. And this is the most difficult backbreaking movement that you need to do it because you are more equipped than somebody like myself. When we started in the 80s, we did not have a torch to light our road, but we used our finger to make it a torch. And we were telling people, follow our finger and follow us in the middle of the darkness, the darkness. Because you, Bushra and Govan and Omar and uh, others, you as leaders should not follow the flow of others, but you should create the flow that others can follow you and let others to follow you. This is my message to you, Sister Bushra. I'm not blinking my eye, but I'm using my finger as a threat. One of my red cards is my finger. When you see my finger, be scared. The second point will be my red card. So the social movement is something we have to entrench ourselves into it. Because we, as young people, are a part of the society. And we should nurture the society with our culture, with our values, with our vision, with our love, with our care, and with our morality. Should not be shy or ashamed of how we look because it's a creation of God. I'm black, I'm happy. I'm white, I'm happy. I'm tall, I'm happy. I'm short, I'm happy. So what? So what? And this is what I'm saying. I have to, I have to be extremely proud of all this, especially moving from the humanitarian response into the social response. This is what is actually from 2005 up till now. Who are you? It's my second or the third point in my first 15 minutes. We have, as a young man, 
or a young woman to identify who am I? What is my role? Do I have a role to play in the society? I can measure my role, develop it, and direct people to help me towards my role. What is my identity? Do I have to create my identity? What is the composition and the characteristic specific the specific characteristic of my identity? The distinctive, the distinctive characteristics of my identity that made me very proud of it and made everybody else to follow an identity like my identity. What's my mission in life? Now we can see one of the smallest signs of, of the day of judgment, which is the sudden death. Sudden death take people who are very healthy, very young. Am I prepared to meet Allah in the middle of the 20s or 30s? All of a sudden, when the death come to me, this is what I'm trying to remind myself in my role, my mission, my identity, and my direction. So these three uh, discussion points are for me to you to start with. I don't want to carry on because I know that at my 15 minutes, yes, yes we've got one minute to go, isn't it, Sister Bushman? I will leave the, the, the most difficult challenge in the second part, which is the philosophy of thinking and the creation of ideology, which will be done by you. You know, I'm pointing my finger not to Brother Muhammad al faqih actually, but to Omar, to Govan, to Bushra, and to you, creating the philosophy of thinking and the direction of ideology and mentoring the generation to come. This is my second part, inshallah, after I listen to my Ustaz Omar Salah. Jazakumullah <laughs> khayran, Dr. Hani Banna. Plenty to think about, mashallah. Excellent. So, um, Dr. Hanbana has shared with us some of his red cards, the, the uh, things to remember and the things to be mindful of for when we want to take things from the humanitarian to the social change. Uh, and now we pass over to Brother Omar, who will be talking to us about bringing faith back into the public spaces and how he managed to do that successfully in the projects that he's been involved in. It's over to you, um, Brother Omar. Jazakallah uh, khairan, Bushra, really appreciate it. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Nabi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu to everyone joining us. Uh, my first uh, of all, I'd like to thank uh, Yasmin and Bushra and uh, the rest of the MAB uh, MAB family and uh, of course MAB youth in particular for organizing tonight's uh, event and uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, uh, I was very, very glad to accept not only that I was actually surprised later on that uh, I have my, uh, my mentor and someone that we all really respect and uh, uh, have learned from, whether directly or indirectly. And I'm one of the very few, I can say, alhamdulillah, uh, who has actually uh, worked directly with Dr. Hani uh, and learned from him uh, on, 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 on several different occasions uh, through his amazing initiatives and projects. And so I highly encourage everyone uh, that uh, whilst we are still in lockdown, that uh, we can utilize uh, digital communication to still benefit from one another, even though we are not able to physically be together in one space. And so uh, Dr. Hani mentioned a very important point around not knowing whether we will live until tomorrow or in our 20s and 30s and so on and so forth. So whilst we can, we should uh, try our very best to learn from the, the gem that is Dr. Hani, Bismillah, mashallah, and all of, the, all of his experience and knowledge. So uh, I am not your estad, and I, and I humbly uh, uh, um, uh, say that I'm not your estad. On the contrary, uh, you mentioned in your, in your speech uh, earlier on that the waiting of saying someone is an estad, I am 
nowhere, nowhere near in comparison to what that title holds. But uh, uh, I am uh, again uh, a very proud uh, student of yours, Alhamdulillah, uh, and I'm always looking. I hope that we all are learning from you, Inshallah Taala. Um, Bushra, you mentioned uh, the the connection of faith and, and social action, and. Uh, my uh, sort of aim, inshallah, in, uh, in all of this is to share with you my, my experience. Um, as many of you are proudly British and proudly Muslim living in this country, how is it that we're able to reconcile our faith um, uh, with the challenges that we may face growing up, with, our, with uh, um, whether it's going to university or, or working afterwards? Um, or even actually maybe you feel that there is a space that you're trying to create, a third alternative space, uh, which uh, creates almost a sense of belonging. Um, and I think there's a key point which actually follows on very well from the previous discussion, which is the question of who, who am I? And, and this question is really, really important in order for us to understand our faith truly and to have a comprehensive understanding of our faith, not only from a a ritual sense or from a spiritual sense in terms of knowing the, 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 the five pillars of Islam and of course practicing them, but also um, what does that mean in terms of my studies? What does that mean in terms of my work? What does that mean in terms of my relationship with my family, with my parents, with my siblings? What does it mean with my relationship with nature, with environment? What does it mean in terms of the way I communicate, the way I, uh, how I travel? Am I conscious of my thinking? Am I conscious of my actions? Am I conscious of my behavior? And am, I con am I emotionally intelligent as well? Um, with not only the intelligence in terms of the, our understanding of IQ, but actually emotional. And, and some would argue actually emotional intelligence is far, uh, far more effective and actually more powerful and moving and transformational than, than, than the IQ as it were. And the reason why I, I mention these is it's how I actually came to the juncture of, you know, founding Ramadan 10 project um, and, and to see it grow to where it is today, Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, And of course, without the, without the volunteers and, you know, the guidance and obviously our dua and obviously planting that initial seed of, of uh, uh, with, with good intentions that we have seen the barakah grow, grow and grow from that. But, um, a lot of this has come as conversations in terms of how do we uh, confidently talk about our faith in sort of public spaces, in particular secular spaces, we, we, we will often associate them as, for instance, museums, for instance, uh, galleries, um, public squares, we are seeing few and few of them uh, in, in large cities. So um, the process of obviously gentrification and the, the, the cutting back on youth centers, the cutting back on spaces for young people to um, uh, express their emotion, express their feeling, express their vision, their ideas. They'll be able to actually have these conversations. You know, quite often with young people, they say, oh, the older generation, they don't listen to us or they don't give us the tools we need or resources, etc., uh, to do what we want. And we are we are sort of neglected. We are unheard. Our voices are not picked up. And and the 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 counter response to that is actually to say, why are you waiting for people to give you a voice? You have a voice. You need to go out and create a space. Of course, it, it's easier if someone is going to give you that shared platform, that shared space. Um, unfortunately, what we have is a uh, a ladder mentality where we like to climb the ladder and take the ladder with us, right? So as opposed to climbing the ladder and then lending it to someone else to also empower and pull them up as well. And so uh, in many ways, you know, the, the idea of RTP was built around a space for young people in particular. And of course it was open to all um, to be able to do a very, very simple thing. And this is something which, you know, generations before us have been doing which is gathering people from different walks of life. You know, I think there's a key theme running in all of this is obviously bridging, building bridges and bridging between different communities and different uh, people to come together to, to do what? And it's primarily to build better understanding. And that is through the you know, simple act of uh, putting our faith into action. 
uh, and not only just uh, as a form of prescriptive action that we, we, we hold individually, but as part of our community. And as a result of that, what will happen is you will naturally attract uh, those hearts and minds, I like to call them. We are in the arena of hearts and minds, and it's about softening those hearts and minds. Uh, not so much about winning them, because there are no winners and losers. This is not for us to judge which hearts are lost and which hearts have been won. But actually our role here, just as we individually try to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and through increasing our remembrance, through increasing our dhikr, that our hearts become tranquil and soft. So at, at the mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the mention of the Rasul alayhi wa sallam, at the mention of hearing the Quran, for example, we naturally are pulled towards it. Right? There is an attraction that pulls us towards it. Our hearts are softened. And those who are away from that, their hearts obviously are hard. They're hardened. And so in between the two, uh, we should for sure surround ourselves with company that reminds us of uh, the importance of why we are here today. Now, the key word uh, belonging, actually, if you look at uh, one of the red cards of, uh, of, of Dr. Hani is uh, of course, the Arabic language. And, and this has occurred to me, you know, after several years of, uh, I'm grateful for my parents who, you know, emphasized the, the importance of Arabic at a young age. And it's opened up, you know, amazing literatures and, and books and, that I would not have come across if I didn't have the grasp of that language. And um, a lot of my work is, you know, both professionally and academically looking at identity politics and belonging in particular. And it's very interesting that when I looked at the word belonging, in Arabic, um, the word that is normally often used is intima, right? And the idea that belonging, yes, you can say it's uh, also a form of integration as well, but generally speaking, the word intima sort of come, comes about. And uh, if you looked at the root word of intima, so as we all know, our, every Arabic, you know, every word we come across in Arabic, you know, if we look at the etymology of it, every, this starts with a three, uh, three, word, three letter uh, uh, root, uh, word, right? So it's uh, noon, wow, and meme. Um, and if you look at that word, actually, subhanAllah, the verb of that word, it means to, uh, means growth. And so it's very interesting that when we look at the word belonging, and it's to be long, right? So you are longing for something, right? But actually the root word of what we are longing for is pushing you away to grow. SubhanAllah. So in our efforts, so maybe we have got this completely wrong. Maybe we have in our journey of belonging, in our understanding of belonging, we have got the formula completely wrong, where we are trying to search for something as we are longing for it to be who we are, i.e. belonging, to belong. Actually, perhaps it is one of the hidden wisdoms of this world that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this world where we're always in chase of this longingness. We're always in chase of a city or a place or a town or a society or a group where we're in constant search of this. But actually, on the contrary, what it is, it's actually to force us to grow and not to remain stagnant and static in one particular area. And so this connects, in, connects very well with the title of tonight's talk, which is um, Faith, uh, uh, an Action, and obviously Local Action, obviously Global uh, Impact. And, and the, obviously the interplay between the two with, with faith, of course. And so with that in mind, if you are on a journey of belonging and our local action, on the contrary, wherever we go, almost is like our passport. So whether we are in London, in the UK or in Birmingham or in Manchester or in Glasgow, um, or whether we are in Istanbul or in, in, the, in the United States of America or South America, wherever it may be, or like Central Asia, Wherever we go, the passport that we hold that allows us to continue doing our acts of service, our, our, our local action, naturally creates that global impact. And I think we've seen this with, with uh, coronavirus, right? The, the past year, pretty much, we have been under lockdown or very, very high uh, uh, levels of, uh, uh, of um, tiered restrictions, which hasn't allowed us to travel, etc. But what it's actually done is opened up opportunities for us to connect with people that we have may not have been able to connect with uh, in, in, in real life. And I say real life, I mean in person, um, physically. So it's actually opened up a lot more avenues 
in that sense. So our action, our, our action has created a global impact. Um, and these are one of the one of the interesting things that our team found in Ramadan. So as you all know, um, lockdown came in uh, towards the end of March in 2020. Um, there were 50 live events that were planned. And unfortunately that was called off, uh, you know, unexpectedly, you know, so you can imagine all the effort, the opportunity cost, the resources, the time, staff, all the planning put into this. Um, of course, the right decision was made, public health and public benefit safety comes first. Um, but of course, need needless to say, you can imagine how much of a downer that put down on, on the volunteers and everyone who was involved in planning this. And so this now represents itself with a challenge, but also an opportunity. With every challenge, there is an opportunity. In the al-usr yusra, there's always this idea that, you know, we face hardship and then we almost remain static. But no, Allah wants us to grow, right? Again, we talk about intima and the uh, and noam, you know? So this idea of how um, we can, you know, almost force ourselves in some cases to grow, but also naturally flow and grow in, in, this, in this arena. And so, alhamdulillah, like the team did a phenomenal campaign where every night of Ramadan, uh, virtual iftars were held, Ramadan packs were done, sent out to uh, different households up and down the country. And um, of course, many lessons were learned. And, and, and actually, as a result of that, this idea of thinking, you know, local action and global impact, they found themselves organizing uh, the world's first 24 hour iftar. So what happened was we circumvented around the globe. We started in London Maghrib time, let's say today, for example. And then we went around, we finished Maghrib in London and then we went to the United States, East Coast. We, we traveled across uh, the States and then we ended up into the West Coast, then Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand, Australia, and then Asia, and then the Middle East, and then Africa, and then Europe, and then back to London, 24 hours. And um, it was, a, a, again, a simple idea a simple idea which the team uh, had thought about. Again, something done as a local action, but actually with massive global impact. So that's probably for me, a, a, a very simple example I would give in terms of how we were able to, uh, under obviously extreme circumstances, still fulfill that mandate of doing something locally, but with a global impact. And again, you know, we, I don't, and I, and I don't want to speak on anyone's behalf here, but I feel like those who are in the in the service of others, on the service of the community, um, I don't believe we go into doing some good or being of service to others, thinking I want to make global impact. It, it, it's about you know changing that one soul, you know softening that one person, or maybe that one good word that you make, you know, almost creates a domino effect. Dr. Hani mentioned it perfectly when he said in the 80s, it was the very first British uh, um, uh, Muslim led humanitarian organization set up. And then, you know, 20, 30 years later, 40 years later, you look, you look back and you think there's over, over 100 now in the UK. And again, it's all about the intention of planting that seed. And subhanAllah, and I talk about planting this intention. I know my time is coming up. I like to end on this point. We talk about planting the seed and obviously the intention, obviously, and growing this, uh, having increasing this global impact. We are in the blessed month of Rajab, right? And it is, it is in Rajab that we plant the seed in preparation to grow and blossom uh, and, and, and bloom for Ramadan, which is two months away, less than two months away. So now is the time that we talk about local action and you know global impact, and of course, this idea of belonging and and planting this uh, this this seed with the um, the intention of goodness, with intention of pure purity, with the intention of sincerity, with the intention of wanting to transform for for the sake of Allah in the way of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Uh, I am certain it has never failed me, and I know people that it has never failed them. When you do something with sincerity, with pure selflessness, of wanting to please Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala first before pleasing any hu human because that is the most important thing, because we don't belong. We know we say, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. You know, often that ayah is used when someone's passed away, but actually so it should be a reminder that we don't belong here. We belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We belong in, the, you know, our belonging that we're searching for is in Jannah, inshallah. And so that's what I'd like to end off with. Barakallahu feekum, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakum wa khair, brother Omar. 
lots to think about there with regards to making impacts locally and how they might impact uh, our wider communities, our wider societies. And a very interesting take on the word belonging and how that uh, reflects in our day-to-day -day life in terms of growth and in terms of uh, being better and, and improving not only our own uh, circumstances in our own communities, but also wider than that as well. That's a lot I for that. We'll go over to Gova now, uh, who will talk to us about some of her experiences where uh, within youth organisations and campaigns with MABI uh, and campaigns wider than that, how she would, in her experience, give to us approaching creating meaningful change in some of the ways that uh, Dr. Hani and Brother Amar have already described and some of the, the practical things that have happened on the ground. Uh, so over to you, Govan. Jazakumullah and firstly, uh, Bushra, um, Mav, Mavi, and um, also to um, Brother Umar and Dr. Hani for your uh, very inspiring talks. I'll try and uh, inshallah, uh, do as good as uh, good of a job as you guys. Oh, thank you. Uh, okay, so I, like Busher said, um, I am going to talk about a couple of my experiences with, um, I guess, campaigning in general um, from both my experience um, that I have gained at Mavi, as well as um, other organizations. And then afterwards, I will you know, go into talk about the Believe and Do Good campaign. Um, as that's the, that's the campaign that is one of the, it's a flagship campaign of Mavi and it's taking place um, this month as we speak. Uh, so yeah, but what I want to do first is I want to start off with a little story, which in my opinion, uh, or at least in my experience, encompasses a lot of the fundamentals um, of what su successful campaigning and um, social activism um, contains, um, or, it, or is all about. Um, it's called the Starfish Story. I don't know if you guys have heard about it, um, but it's essentially about a man who one day uh, walks on the beach. Uh, he walks along the beach and he sees a young boy uh, from afar. He then, um, and the young boy is essentially what he's doing is he's picking up things on the ground and he's gently throwing it into the ocean. Um, the man approaches the young boy and he asks him, you know, what are you doing? Um, what is this that you're throwing back into the ocean? Um, and he says, uh, and the young boy, sorry, says that um, I'm picking up starfish, I'm throwing starfish back into the ocean. Uh, the surface up and the tide is uh, going out. And if I don't throw them back into the ocean, they, they're going to die. And the man, the man uh, laughs and he says to the boy, um, there are miles and miles of, of beach and there are hundreds of starfish. Like what difference can you make? Um, you, you won't be able to make a difference. Um, look at how many there are. And the boy um, reach, bends over, reaches another starfish, um, throws into the ocean and smiling and politely responding back to the old man, he says, well, I made a difference to that one. So the whole, the moral story of what I personally, why I, I love the story is because first of all, it shows us that during with campaigning, social activism, first of all, um, what needs to be done is you need to tackle you tackle the problem by breaking it down so of course this boy can see um just as an example this boy can see that there are millions there are hundreds of starfish but if he looks at it like that if he takes a step back and he just says there are hundreds of starfish then he will become overwhelmed he'll become overwhelmed he doesn't know where to start um it's just too much it results in procrastination um you just think okay this i, I can't do this this is not i won't be able to do anything this is somebody else's problem um, however, when you take the problem, especially with a lot of social problems, such as, for example, let's say homelessness and, and you know, like world hunger and these kind of things, when you look at them, you're very, it, it really overwhelms you. What, what you, you should do or what works for me is, is taking that issue and breaking it down into smaller chunks. And if need be, take those smaller chunks and break them out into, down into further chunks and addressing each problem that way. And that way, everything seems a lot more feasible you don't get overwhelmed and it's the problems just become easier to tackle and the the the, the different chunks can be spread amongst yourselves it can be spread um if each person takes on a different uh, a different uh, chunk or a different mind issue um a different issue that will help solve the major issue um it will yeah it's, it will become a lot more feasible and other people are also partaking um so the first point is take the problem look at the, the massive problem break it down into smaller pieces 
and approach them one step at a time. Um, the second um, moral of the story is, uh, or message from the story is that change starts with you. Um, now that doesn't mean that, and I think uh, brother, um, brother Omar touched upon this as well, um, that you change starts with you. And, and this doesn't mean that you have to take on the whole, the whole challenge or the whole problem that's that's taking place at the moment by yourself it just means that you utilize your voice you you are the one you're the first one to stand up you're the one that realizes that there is a problem that this problem needs solving and i'm not going to wait for other people to, to you know to take on this to to solve this problem uh, or at least tackle it that because everyone what you'll find is it, it, usually what happens is oh, okay this is we think this is somebody else's problem and that other problem that other person most likely is also thinking, oh, this is somebody else's problem. Like someone else is taking care of it. And we us thinking that someone is taking care of it and others thinking that we are taking care of it means that no one is taking care of it, but we just think that everyone, everyone else is taking care of it. So change starts with you. You need to be the first person to, or one of the first people, it, it can be within a group, it can be yourself, um, standing up and saying, okay, this is a problem. This needs to be tackled. How are we going to do this? And inshallah, you'll find that, first of all, this, this creates it could potentially cause uh, create a ripple effect. Um, you'll find that other people follow in your footsteps. And um, particularly if you're a young person, you'll find that a fellow, uh, young people always tend to look up to young people more than, than adults, or at least in my experience. Um, if, if, some, if a young person is doing something, or if, if for example, take, take your parents, for example, if your parents tell you to do something, you're like, ah, oh, no, that's not cool, but my friend said this. Um, you tend to like listen and look up to your friends and it's all like peer pressure and that kind of stuff. Um, you look up to your friends. And so if you see a young person doing something, the chances are that the other youth will also look up to you and they will follow in your footsteps. Like you're essentially paving the path to change. Um, and, and an example of this is for example, Greta Thunberg, um, who I'm sure that you've all heard about, um, who started the school strike for climate, the Fridays for Future hashtag, um, and initially it was just her, um, every Friday she would go outside, she would was, she was sit in the middle of town uh, or someplace in Sweden, and she would have her, her sign with, with Fridays for Future written on it. And, you know, people, people saw her, people noticed her. Um, and before you knew it, like she had a massive following, people were following in her footsteps and, you know, global warming and, you know, the climate problem just became such a hot topic. Um, so that's just an example. Um, you also need to, uh, from experience, you need to you need to believe. You need to have full, um, unshakable belief that change is possible. So it's no good you seeing a problem and then trying to address it. But at the back of your mind, you're second guessing whether it's even possible. You're like, well, I'm not sure. Is it? I'm 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 just gonna do it for the sake of it. But really, I don't really think that this is uh, this is possible like that is not gonna help. You need to have 100% belief that this is possible. Um, if, you, if you believe it, you can achieve it. Um, if you don't believe it, you will, the minute you reach the first couple of hurdles, uh, you'll be set back and you will think, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to go any further. However, if you do believe that you, this is possible, you will, um, you will overcome those hurdles, uh, hurdles, sorry. You will all overcome those hurdles to so we'll keep going and you know, inshallah, you will may it may not be in our generation, in, in, in our times that we will see the change, but it's important, it's part of the it, it's part of the process. Um, you're initiating the process and you are helping uh, again making work easier for others who will then, if you're not able to continue, other people will come. Or if you're not there anymore, other people will come and, and can pick up the work. Um, but you need to have full belief and you need to continue going. Um, I mean, like any all of the people who have um, like all of the people who are in like the history books, like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, all these guys, they would have never have, have reached where they are today, or they would have never been able to achieve what they achieved um, had they not had full belief that these things were possible. Um, so yeah, so believe, have full belief. Um, there's a, there are a lot of things that we can't control in life, but your beliefs, your thoughts, you can control. Um, so that's that's another point that I wanted to make. And also, like, if you're set back, if you um, face any obstacles, uh, just remember, like, these are, they're not, 
it's it, they're not failures. The only failures if you don't learn from them. Otherwise, they're lessons, and they will help. And there is a saying say, um, that the fastest way to succeed is to double your failure rate. Um, but really, like you need those things will only teach you how to. You will you will learn from the lesson your lessons, and you will get back up, and you will continue uh, going, inshallah. And um, and another thing from the story that I I I think is really important that we exhibit in our in, in any work that we do is having good morals and, um, and, and, and really good manners. Um, at the end of the day, we are doing the things that we are trying to do to, in order to please Allah. Um, this young boy, regardless of what the man said to him, like he, he kind of belittled what he was doing and he, was, he didn't have faith in him. He just smiled at him and politely responded to him. Um, we, in the work that we are doing, we're trying to please Allah. We don't want to um, cancel that out by, by you know, responding negatively or responding in in um, in rude and um, hurtful ways to people, um, it's really important that we do the work that we do with with ihsan and with with the um, with with the best of morals and really representing Islam, because we have to remember that whether we like it or not, we are um, we are representing Islam when when we do the work that we do, and also this is a form of dawah when people see um, a Muslim put. Like dawah is not necessarily always like preaching to to the masses, saying you know come to Islam uh, and so on and so forth. Um, dawah can also be done through your actions, people looking at you and seeing the good that you're doing. And and let's not forget that actions speak louder than words. Um, so especially when it comes to things, and you guys as as you guys already know, um, Islam is subject to a lot of. Um, a lot of um, scruti scrutinizing by the media. Uh, we are being attacked left, right, and center a lot of the time. Um, and you know, when people hear certain things about Islam, especially someone who has not come across a Muslim before, let's say it's a non-Muslim who hasn't come across a Muslim. Um, I mean, you can't exactly fault them for thinking. Sorry, you can't exactly fault them for, for thinking certain th certain certain things about Muslims. Um, but it's our job that when, so that when they do come across the Muslim, that they see our morals, they see that the way what we are not just our morals, but also like the, the work that we're doing, the good work that we're doing in our communities. Um, and and if if they see that, they will most likely um, believe us as opposed to like for example the media and what they hear from other people uh, who aren't Muslims. So it's really important that we do carry ourselves um, with with the best of manners, with the best of morals and akhlaq uh, when we do the work that we're doing. Um, when we do the work that we do, um, and a couple of yeah, and a couple of other things that I won't go into too much detail about because I I know that I'm short for time, um, is things such as renewing your intentions. Uh, these are also things that are very important when doing this kind of work. Um, a lot of you're not expected to always um, carry out. You, you can't expect one person to to do everything, um, but it's it's really important that. A lot of okay, so a lot of people um, are not able to to do a lot of things, and they are only able to, for example, um, do very limited things, and that's okay. So long as you know, so long as people are doing what um, is within their own, within their capacity, what, what within what they're able to do, it's okay if it's only minor things, small things. So long as you have the right intentions, uh, because as you know, actions are by intentions. Um, and um, so even if you have a small intention, then inshallah, you can be rewarded massively. Um, sometimes you have, you do an amazing, like a massive deed, but if you have a, an impure intention that can result in, in, your, in that action becoming void, or you can even become sinful for that action. Um, so renewing your intentions, um, also not belittling the impact that a small deed can have. Um, any, any deed, wh whatever you're able to do, like just, just do whatever you're able to do. Uh, don't think that, you know, I'm not able to do, um, that this, this little thing won't have a massive impact. Do whatever you're able to do. And if everyone does their own little bits, then inshallah overall, um, it, will, it will create a massive impact. Um, and I think for the sake of time, I'm going to have to move on to badge in the, in the next section. Um, in the next part about of three minutes if you want to make a start on what badges and some of the okay. activities that have, yeah feel free to do that. all right cool okay um so moving on from this 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 was like general um campaigning tips that are campaigning uh lessons that i had 
uh, or activism lessons that I have picked up during my time. Um, now I want to move on to Badge, um, which is a campaign uh, that stands for Believe and Do Good. Um, it's a collaborative campaign between FOSIS and, and MAVI, uh, FOSIS being the Federation of Student Islamic Societies. Um, it was founded in 2015 by FOSIS and later on MAVI joined on a couple of months later. Um, the, the campaign is inspired by the Quran and Sunnah, um, mainly, although, like, although the campaign has evolved over the years, um, some of the acts have changed. This year in particular, we've had to change, we, we've changed quite a lot of, of things um, because of COVID, because of also a need for different um, acts of good. So I'll get into the acts of good later on, what exactly they are. Um, but yeah, so over the years it has evolved, but the main thing that, that has always remained the same is that the campaign was founded on, you know, the fact that in Islam, it isn't simply enough for us to say that we believe, but that we must couple this belief with action. Um, and one I in particular that um, that was used to to com to create this campaign is the is the one from Surah Asr, uh, whereby um, Allah says that indeed mankind is a loss except for those who have believed and done righteous deeds. Um, again, showing that we must couple belief with action. And that's really important. Um, and and with this action, it's essentially it's act. It, it can be it can be any action. It can be like doing good to your parents, doing good to your neighbors. But it's it can also be activism, um, resulting in faith based activism. Um, and it's really important that, in my opinion, that that you know the activism work that we do and the and the changes that we are trying to create in in society is based on uh, or is founded on 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 Islam or is faith based. Um, because just as in our normal day-to-day -day lives, how we utilize our faith, we utilize Islam, Islam as a moral compass, it's our manual in, life, in our day-to-day -day life, um, we, we revolve um, everything that we do around our five daily prayers, around our faith, it's also important that our activism is also, uh, also, revol is also founded and, and, and um, uh, the guide um, Sorry, it's our, our, our the Islam is also the guide um, for our activism. Um, so yeah, um, and another couple of things about the campaign is that we have approximately eighty different affiliates, um, both international and national affiliates. Um, we have two international affiliates this year, um, and that's Armida Albania and EMF from France. Uh, from France. Um, France's part have uh, been with us for a couple of years. And mashallah, you know, they're amazing. They, the work is amazing. Um, so is Albania's work. Um, and then of course, these, these um, affiliates are from both, are both Mabi and uh, Fosis affiliates, by the way. Um, so moving on to the campaign. No, sorry, the objectives. Sorry, Busha, shall I stop? Would it be, I think it would be good to stop here and then moving on to, to the objectives later on. Okay, yeah, we can do that, inshallah. Thank you very much, Govan. So, um, no so worries. for your, for your um, discussion around the Believe and Do Good campaign, some advice that you've given us regarding being active in our communities, some really important lessons that we've picked up there. One thing that really stood out for me in terms of uh, recognising the local actions and the global impact is just how far the Believe and Do Good campaign has reached. So, subhanAllah, something yeah. that began in in the uk i would even dare to say in england has gone to you know all, all the corners of the uk but also across europe so france and albania something really really uh, to be proud of i think and uh, alhamdulillah may allah accept all the efforts of all the volunteers who are working across the globe as um, part of this initiative and this campaign um, okay so jazakallah khair for the three uh, of our speakers dr um hani al-banna dr uh, brother omar Salha, soon to be doctor inshallah and uh, sister govan uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to have a round of questions that some of them are coming in. I stopped spotlighted myself by accident. Hold on a second. Uh, spotlight for everyone. Uh, we're going to bring in some questions that are being asked on uh, either here through Zoom or on other platforms. The attendees, those of you who would like to ask questions, you can direct them at any one of the um, uh, panel members or you can ask to, to all. Uh, also, if you're uh, if you would like to type in your question on the chat, please feel free to do that. I'll begin with a question to Dr. Herney. Um, so, Zafar for your talk, and part of the things that you mentioned was about being having this concern for this community and and our societies. And I think perhaps to our audiences who are slightly 
maybe older and people who have been active in the work for a while that's something that comes to them naturally they they see the the need to be active in their communities they see the concern for people in uh, you know in their societies when it comes to younger audiences and, and the people in our communities you know young adults maybe teenagers juniors how do we plant that concern for the communities whether that's muslim communities or wider communities and how do we make people feel in a world where individualism is, is, you know, is encouraged, how do we make people understand and feel that they have a duty towards others to encourage them to be active and to help others? I think I may need to unmute you before you speak. Uh, let me see how I can do this. Alhamdulillah, uh, I think it is the responsibility of the elder and so-called leaders to take the younger generation by hand while they are in the leadership position. No leader, and this take it for me as a statement with my warning finger again, which might bring another red card to the leaders. The leaders is an absolute failure if during his or her time does not create leadership to stay behind them. The process of creating young leadership has to be created while you are in office, while you are in position, not while you are giving talks or bayan or khutbah or others. Don't keep looking to the leaders too much on the mirror. Look too much to the society surrounding you. Empowerment is the name of the game. We cannot empower people unless we throw them to the deep end and let them to come back to us and show them the way. So this is what you need to tell such called, people calling themselves uh, peers or imams or sheikhs or alim or, or, or. Those or with S at the end of it, which is my English language, but the S before, after or, are not leaders. That's why you are not moving to the understanding of intima mentioned by Brother uh, Omar, which is the developing and the growth of the society. Society cannot grow unless we keep a space while we are leading the society to people to come and share us on our platform, on our platform, to be seen with us to take the photograph with us, to be shadowing us, then to let them to lead us while we are in the leadership position. Volunteering is the name of the game. You have to create a very strong volunteering system in the country and empower the young people to do this kind of volunteerism in different aspects of social life. Going to the hostel, I wrote a document in 96 or 97 called Grassroots. You can, you can borrow it from me. It's about I'm 20 or 15 uh, or 30 pages, something like this. Talking about what? Talking about window cleaning, collection of the rubbish after Christmas and New Year's, planting a tree, visiting the elderly, going to the hospital, to, to, to visit the elderly people who nobody visit them, because I feel sorry for our parents from the non-Muslim community when they sit in on their bed, looking at us visiting our relative and friends and nobody visiting them. This is, this is the training. You don't need an elder to tell you go to the hospital with a flower, with, uh, with a smile, with the chocolate, with, with, with all these sort of things. So really, this is extremely important. But I was excited by Govan and by, Mah by uh, Omar, I will tell you Muhammad. Omar said, simple idea, great civilization, start a simple idea. And for Govan, I was going to tease her with a lot of my hashtags, because I'm a hashtag individual, Responsibility is an ability or is ability. Care is share. Uh, 
believe is relief. Hashtag me, I tag hash you. You know tag hash and hashtag? If you follow my tag hash, I follow your hashtag. I think the media if, office in MAB need to frame some of these. Uh, some of these well, you have the recording, but you have to pay me the royalty. That's it. We will do that. What else? Can you make it happen? <laughs> FTG, FTG means fill the gap philosophy. Whenever you go to a society, look at the gaps. But when you fill the gaps, fill it with a product. Even when you decide to collect the rubbish, it becomes an industry. It becomes a recycling industry. FTG for the tag hash and hashtag. There is no ceiling for education, for learning, for achievement, for meeting challenges for overcoming challenges. This is what I talk from your talks. The, 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 the difference between me and you at least 40 years, 45 years or 50 years in the case of uh, Govan and, uh, and Bush, because they have to be in the 20s, but you have to be in the 40, brother, <laughs> brother Omar. But the girl has to be in the 20s all the time. So this kind of thing is right really important. <laughs> Thank you, sister. It's always the right answer. The no matter who, yes, no matter who you're talking to, they have to you be. You are still in the 20s. <laughs> but Omar is in the 50 now. <laughs> I finished. Really, uh, really important lessons there. Tag hash me, I hashtag you. That's it. I think the boys have picked it up in the chat as well. So, uh, mashallah, lots of inspiration going on here today. Uh, we'll move on to another question that's actually come up quite a lot. A lot of people are asking it in the chat, and it's something that I'd noted down to ask um, our speakers today. So this one will be aimed at Omar first, and then if Govan, you want to add to it as well, please feel free to do so. And the question is around burnout. So people have recognized their, uh, the duty. They've taken part in being active and giving back to their com uh, communi uh, communities. They understand the obligation. And now they feel worn out. They've done their bit either because they're tired and that so much has been expected of them or because they feel, do you know what? I spent my 20s, let's say, doing this and now I'm in my 30s or 40s, Dr. Hani, um, and now, you know, I don't need to do anything anymore. How can we address both of these issues? The first one being, I'm too tired to continue and the second one being, I've done my bit, I don't need to do anymore. Uh, should, I, should I go ahead first, Bushra? And... Please, if you don't mind, yeah. And then we'll go yeah. with Govan if she has anything to add, inshallah. Inshallah, yeah. Um, it's a great question. It's honestly, it's a very sincere and it's one that we sort of maybe neglect and not really take take much attention to. Um, I think from, from, from what I've experienced, at least, me, and I know Dr. Hani, mashallah, has already added another 20 years to my, to my age, which I'll accept. Um, I think with burnout, there, there are um, signs which as young leaders, we'll be able to be put into positions of, of, I think, taking care of ourselves, which we don't often do. We're so much, we're so fixated and passionate about wanting to help others. But if we don't take care of ourselves as well, and I mean this in every sense, whether it's that physically, emotionally, um, in terms of um, mentally as well, if we don't take actions and steps to actually look after our being on the whole, then actually we will not be in a position to help others. It's quite simple as that. And actually this is why, you know, the hadith of the Rasulullah is that, yes, charity is great, but the best of charity is where you start off with is at home, right? And, and, and it's not only in the literal sense that, okay, I have to start off at home here, but also the idea from that hadith is also to look at, well, if your, if your core is not looked after then that will be the first thing to go if you burn out and give yourself away completely to to serving others and and, and leaving at that so but at the same time it requires uh, courage to own up to being close to being burnt out or being in a state of burnout and why i say that is Often I've met people where I've identified signs and even with myself where people become a little bit irritable or become a little bit like um, impatient and suddenly 
this now has moved from a source of mahabba, source of passion, source of wanting to give something freely, and then actually comes into sort of almost like a chore, right? And then it's like, oh, I have to do this as long and no longer a passion. That's where you need to say, stop, let me go away, take a time out and then spend a week, spend two days, spend an hour, whatever, whatever it may be, away from the actual act itself, from the campaign, whatever it may be, to go away, clear your mind, feel refreshed, come back and come back with energy, come back full of energy and ready to, to go again. And, and that requires um, a lot of self-development work. And, and wh why I say this is, and this may be sort of like another hashtag or a lot of trend about self-development goals, et cetera, but I generally mean this. I think a lot of us don't actually pay much attention about developing ourselves, our way of thinking. You know, we think of, oh, philosophy, I don't want to come near that. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to read any philosophical books. I don't want to read classics. I don't want to watch a documentary about 18th century um, uh, uh, um, uh, painting and how it, you know, uh, uh, um, sort of was popular culture amongst amongst uh, amongst the aristocrats in Europe and so on and so forth. What I'm saying is, there's a lot of knowledge and uh, uh, and information out there, and I think it's only through what's becoming more apparent is interdisciplinary studies is it becoming ever so important in this day and age, right? The, the, the ability to read about history, to read about individuals and how they coped with such stress. And because we're comparing ourselves to almost being robotic in that way, where we feel like we wake up, you have to continue doing what you're doing and so on and so forth. It, it, it's, it's, so it's important that we have to invest in ourselves. We must absolutely invest in ourselves, in our well-being. Um, I've learned this probably the hard way, but I've learned and I've developed as well, where I've known actually, if there's a time that I need to tell my peers or volunteers, go away for five days and come back, please. Because the state you're in right now is you're not ready to serve people. You need to go away and, you know, take a break, uh, 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 almost reconnect, recharge your batteries and come back. And, and that is incredibly important. Um, but again, it requires, uh, requires us to build the skill set and expertise to identify these. Sometimes because we're very part and parcel of ourselves, we don't have that mirror to reflect and look at ourselves and say, here's the issue because we're too comfortable in our own skin. So <laughs> you, we've got to be able to actually be prepared to pull up the mirror sometimes and say, I need to own up. I'm not in a position to, to lead now. Let me step aside and allow someone else to lead, right? And this is why, subhanAllah, how, you know, with, with positions of leadership over time, we see they're more susceptible to corruption, right? <laughs> and so, again, it's one of those things where we need to be able to look at how we can benefit the community for sure, but also for ourselves, we need to recharge. And even, I would, I would also make the point and go as far as to say, we, we, we connect guilt with burnt out. So Ramadan is coming up, right? A lot of the time we think, I did not pray Taraweeh, I did not read Quran, and I feel miserable, and I feel burnt out in Ramadan that I haven't, haven't made the most of it, right? And so, you know, naturally, one would say, okay, I have these goals that I want to do for Ramadan, and you exert yourself too much, and actually you feel burnt out, and you're unable to complete the month. But that's why, that's why subhanAllah, it is a month, because it's a, it's, it's a process. Ramadan is a process for you to begin a new chapter and it's not the end. When you reach the end of Ramadan, it's the beginning of a new chapter, right? And it's the idea of how the most beloved deeds of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are what? The most consistent, right? Not the ones which I'm going to now literally go out and we talk about global impact. So this is why I say it's an excellent question because it ties in very well. The idea of impact isn't I want to do this one event and then hurrah, massive event, it, it got, it got in, the, in the news and, and you know, it's being talked about here and there, etc. That is not the impact. The impact is sustainability. The impact is about continuing doing this for a long time and consistency. And that's why I think, as Sister Gova mentioned, you know, when it becomes almost akin to your character and your morals, that's who you are, wherever you are around, wherever you are around the globe, whichever day of the year it is, whichever time of the day it is, that's, that's your brand. So if 10 years go by, you are surrounded around, around someone, you know how you feel with them because that's who they are. Jazakallah khairan. Sorry, I went a bit too, too long there. Jazakallah khairan. No, uh, I think there's, there was lots of benefit from
from there, inshallah. And um, I think it links in well with what uh, Dr. Hani was mentioning before about identifying who you are and what your role is. And if you're somebody who identifies yourself as being out there and being helpful, being of service to the community automatically links into you being available and, and building in those breaks, as you said, um, and it does take that recognition and training. The other part of the question was, and I don't know if we'll, we'll go to Govan and then come back to you, Omar, if you had more to add, was about those of us who maybe have been active, but then decided that that was enough. That's it. I've done my bit and I don't need to do any more because I feel that I've accomplished what I need to do. Uh, can we truly ever call ourselves done? Can we ever say that, we, you know, we've done three years at ISOC, you know, two years at FOSIS, five years with Islamic Relief, I'm done, right? Can we do that? Uh, Govan, we'll go to you and then we'll see if uh, our other speakers also have anything to add to that. Um, do you want me to add to the first question? Yeah, please, about burnout. All right, um, So, Brother Omar uh, pretty much covered most of it, the things that I would have said. Um, but just to re-emphasize and reiterate, um, it's really important that you you speak up. You you're honest. Like there's nothing wrong with speaking up. I know that mental health and certain certain things have maybe been an issue in the past. But I, alhamdulillah, you know, it's becoming a lot more normalized now to to speak up and say, okay, it's I, I'm reaching burnout. It's it's getting too much uh, for me. So it's it's really important that you do that. Speak to if you're part of a team. Um, speak to your president, speak to maybe your HR, and um, let them know that you're reaching that point. And don't tell them once you've burned out, tell them as you start to feel um, that you're really burning out. You can, you will start to feel it. And that's when you need to speak up. And there is, um, like I said, there's nothing wrong with doing that. As a matter of fact, it's, I would say it's very brave. Um, if you would be able to, if, if someone was to do that. Um, and also don't assume that because you can't assume that others know that you're burning out. I know sometimes at the back of our heads, we are like, we're thinking, well, they should kind of know, like, look at the workload they've given me. They, need, they should know that I am, you know, I'm swamped with, you know, I'm just drowning in work. Um, but not everyone will know. And it's really important that you communicate to people that this is, you are starting to reach that point and you do need help. And there's nothing wrong with asking for help at all. Um, like Brother Omar said, um, if you burn out yourself, you don't, if you don't take care of yourself, how are you able? How are you supposed to give back to people if if you are gone? You won't be able to do that. Um, and so it's really important that you take care of yourself first. Sometimes that means that you need to be a bit selfish, and that you need to maybe take a step back. And there's nothing wrong with that. Take a step back and say, okay, I need I need a little break, um, because everyone needs, it, especially if you're part of an organization, for example, maybe where you know. Our term is two years. You cannot be expected to. Um, you're not expected to like for, throughout those two years to be working constantly. Um, it's 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 not expected of you. Um, so it's there's nothing wrong with you taking a break. There's nothing wrong with you taking a step back. And also, I think um, ensure that you delegate. Um, it's me personally. I'll be honest. I have maybe had delegation issues in the past. Um, but if you delegate to your team, if you have a team, have a team of people who are um, available. Like I, for me personally, if, if my team, they may not have experience. If somebody doesn't have experience, that's fine. But if your team members are, are willing to learn, if they're available and they're committed, then that's all that matters. Because then that means that when you delegate, that they will, they will pick up on the work and they will help you. Um, it's no good having... Um, from experience, it's, it's like it's it's no good having a team that where everyone is just have so many responsibilities that they aren't able to do the work that's in your team um, that is required of your team. So yeah, have a team of um, people who are available. Um, ensure to delegate. Um, and also regarding the second question uh, about people feeling like they've done their part and that it's time for them to maybe stop. Um, me personally, I think there's nothing wrong with taking a break take a break, whether it's a year break, two years break. Um, and it doesn't mean like uh, once your break is done, once you've you know, recovered and everything and you feel like you're, back, you're ready, you don't necessarily have to jump into an organization and like Maddy or Map and, and do the same work they used to do before. I would even recommend like during your little break, do small things. Like it's really important that we don't stop. Like we shouldn't stop. In, and I, I'll be honest, like we shouldn't stop. Um, but you can cut down on the workload. You can, you can, you don't have to do massive things. You don't have to, you know, plan conferences and whatnot. Just do small things, small acts of good. Um, 
and do them regularly. The, the most beloved deeds to Allah are those who, that are done, uh, that are small but done regularly. Um, so, so do those and, and do something that you're also, also something that you're passionate about so that it doesn't feel like you are, um, so it doesn't maybe feel so, so burdensome, I guess. If you're burned out, you don't want to do something that, you know, you have no more, no passion for. It might be that you're really into baking and, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and for you, that's therapeutic. So that will help you both mentally, that will help you on your break. But also you can take those and you can donate them to your neighbors because you know that, um, you know, your neighbors have a right upon you and, and Allah values and uh, regards your neighbors very highly. Um, so it can be something like that. It can just be small things, small things that you're passionate about. Um, and just doing those small things, um, I would, I would, I would say, but don't ever stop. I would not recommend that. Um, yeah. Great advice. Thank you. And we've got nods from uh, Dr. Ernie as well there. No worries. So widen your uh, your idea of what it is to do good so it doesn't have to necessarily be volunteering for uh, an organization or being an executive officer in, in a committee it might be small acts as you mentioned there um really important uh, points to take on inshallah um anybody want to add to any of those points uh how you muted yourself go ahead no no dr handy i think wants to say wants to say something i want to make uh, my message I can add a little bit to it, but please, I won't. Please I, go you ahead. told me to have your message at the end. We know. do want a message at the end, yeah. We're, yeah. we're not quite yeah. there, but if you want to do that, yes. Yeah. Now, yeah, go Because ahead. I can catch my time before my time catches me. Yeah, I think that's a First good First of all, uh, regarding, I'm just keeping tag, tag hashing you. You speak my language to understand my philosophy of thinking. If you are rising to the standard of the philosophy of thinking, you keep reversing the language backward and speak it in a way that people understand it. You got me? If you don't get me, I see you around. <laughs> you may, this is my language. <laughs> you may need to repeat that one more time so that if we do bump into you again, then... No, no, I say it once because I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a, a recording machine. <laughs> Take it from the recording. I think start with whenever I fell down, I go to the field. I come back, boom, booming. Okay. Whenever I felt that I, I ran out of something, I go there and they energize me. This is the source of my encouragement and empowerment. Uh, if the leader is not burning, uh, if the leader is not burned out, the followers will not. It's up to the leader to keep going. That's why the Prophet ﷺ was the first to collect the wood. It was the hardest way. The first to respond in, uh, to the, 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 the noise which came out when everybody waking up and said, what's going on? He was coming back from where he was. So the sleepless nights of the leader will keep everybody on their feet, on their toes, never burned out, okay? Uh, this is my, my response. But actually, I come from my message. Islam is the religion of social interaction. It is not just a statement, it's a belief. Social change and social justice. This is the cornerstone of the belief in the message of Islam. Social interaction, social change, and social justice. We cannot call ourselves Muslims if we don't interact. That's what the Prophet said. Muslim The Muslim who, who, who mix or interact with people and become patient for their, their hardship towards him is far more better than the one who does not mix with people. My message is, now the challenge you are going to face, I'm leaving and you are staying behind, is social movement you have to cement the fabric of the social
social infrastructure of the community to create the most effective social movement. We cannot afford people like yourself at your edge cannot actually create this kind of dynamic, effective, actually organized social movement to move the masses, not on emotional ground, but on intellectual ground, on philosophical ground, on value-based ground, on moral ground. You got the message, sisters and brothers, this is a challenge. We started from humanitarian, very easy, to social. But the most important and most difficult one is within the social movement, we have to talk about things that we are not doing, like advocacy, research, connection, communication, partnership, and creating leadership. It is a challenge. Go out and tell every mosque imam or mosque leaders or most Islamic organization, where is the succession plan for you? Where is the succession plan? The mosque is not yours as a board member or as an imam or as a leader. The organization is not yours. You are not inherited it from your family. Succession plan to bring the future leadership. We are recycling some of the leaders that actually we are fed up with our leadership a leader like myself. This number two. Not like yourself, but uh, the message. No, 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 no. Let, let me finish. <laughs> let me finish. The last one is to go deep down. Now we went from the uh, 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 humanitarian to the social. I'm putting my my, my finger on your head, brother uh, Omar. To the philosophy of thinking, of what is going on in his mind. I want to change the philosophy of a thinking through creating a new philosophy. And this is a challenge. This is a challenge, I'm not joking. I want to change the, his philosophy of thinking by creating another philosophy to change the culture surrounding us. So people should follow the philosophy of your culture to create the idea to save humanity. And this is the most difficult one. You go deep down into the heart and the mind and the soul of the human being. That's why the Prophet started as a social worker, but he went as a mentor to massage the mind and the soul and the spirit of his followers. And this is your role now. You will live to do it. You will live to do it, Sister Govan. And this 31 individual listening to me with my finger pointing to them, you live to do it, whether you are old or young. We want, we want, we want to change the philosophy of thinking of the masses through creating new ideology to save humanity. Find a way. PhD is good, but not good enough. Master is good, but not good enough. It is the ability to see what is hidden of treasures at the back of the mind of the individuals listening to you by their hearts, by their minds, by their souls. And this is the challenge. And this is my message. If I don't see you again, you do it. How to do it? up to you but you know what when we started we didn't know where to go but allah took us by the hand to go where we are here today if you do this kind of the philosophy inside the mind and the soul and the spirit of the man and the woman put your hand in the hand of the creator and you will create the way of the new philosophy of who can treat humanity equally the people of Yemen, the people of uh, Azidi in Iraq, the people of Bosnia. The Uyghur people. 
the Rohingya people, the Syrian people, Syrian children in this weather, some of them don't have tents. What social change we are making? What global or local to global we are making? If you don't want to be burned out, leave the issue of others. While you're leaving the issue of others, you leave it with others. The people in Congo, South Sudan, everywhere. This is the role we need to change to make a new philosophy to stop what's happening now. Difficult for you, Sister Govan, Sister Bushra, and to the 29 people listening to us, and to you, brother, Ismake Omar, but I'm confident that you will do it. And I stretch my hand to you and touch your hand and say, you will do it, inshallah. Uh, really, really wise words there and something that truly makes us reflect and, and just makes us feel that our responsibility in this world is not a small one. Um, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will provide us the tool and the, and the tawfiq to do this inshallah. Barakallah feek. Final remarks from uh, Sister Govan and then we'll move on to final remarks from Brother Omar, and then our uh, president, uh, Sister Raghad Takriti, will share with us a few words just to end with, inshallah. So, uh, Govan, over to you with final remarks uh, whenever you're ready. Jazakallah um, khairan. I think that was very touching, um, Dr. Hani. Um, and you are, I don't know, I, I just want to say something on that first, and you're absolutely right. And something that maybe I, something that I encourage as well. Um, for example, during the Believe and Do Good campaign, where one of the, the acts is, it used to be feeding the homeless, but now it's helping the homeless. I always, I always encourage um, to go out and help the homeless, not on a good day, not on a sunny day, but when the weather conditions, when it's freezing, when it's, when it's raining, when it's, you know, when, it's, when the conditions are, are tough, especially that's when they need us the most. That's when we should go out because that's, I guarantee, I've, I've tried, you know, I've, I've done a homeless feed in um in just cold conditions and just standing out there for half an hour for an hour you know your hands are freezing you you're really cold you can't wait to go home and it just makes you reflect and it makes you think you know these these people are going through this on a daily basis these people are going through this um i don't know 24 hours a day 365 days a year it's it i, I really i really agree with with what you're saying with you know going out um, um trying to living the condition of trying to, to, to see like first-hand experience what people are going through. Um, so yes, for that, uh, Fik, sorry for that. Um, closing remarks. Um, so you mentioned the feed for the homeless, there were the other acts as well that you wanted to talk yes. So we have, um, so just going back to badge, we have, we have four different acts of good. Um, and these all, they're all there to like, to help meet the objectives of badge which is to encourage our muslim youth to go out and you know do carry out creative and engaging acts of good um, in the process developing themselves becoming um leaders of tomorrow um driving positive change in society as well as um in in the process of course showcasing the beauty of our religion counteracting those negative stereotypes that people have about islam and our religion um so, and, and those, four, those four different acts of good is um, helping the homeless. So it used to be feeding the homeless, but we realized that those, feeding the homeless simply was not enough. Um, there's a lot of things that they go through. They, you know, sometimes more important than food is, is just a genuine conversation, just sitting there and making them feel heard, making them feel seen. Um, there, there are homeless people, I've, I've heard comments from homeless people saying that, you know, they don't feel seen. They feel like they're invisible to people. People walk past people, they lower their, their gaze, they look away when they see them. Um, 
and and just you know having a genuine conversation and and other things like it doesn't have to be feeding the homeless but it, and all of this is extremely important um just as we suffer from mental health issues just as we suffer you know some of us may suffer from loneliness the homeless people do probably do that even more um so we we created so we changed that to helping the homeless um we also have environmental care which used to be street cleans um i what Either Dr. Hani or uh, Brother Ahmed mentioned this, but we need sustainable change. And cleaning the streets simply was not sustainable. Um, it was, you know, if, especially in parts of, of the UK, like Birmingham, you clean the streets today, tomorrow, it's right back to how it was. Um, and, you know, it was it was good in the sense that people saw the good acts, uh, the, good, the, the good things that we were doing as Muslims. Um, we had non-Muslims walk past us um, saying, you know, well done, thank you so much for doing this. Um, people were seeing that Muslims were doing um, good work, um, and and it was and it was beneficial in that way. But we could, in order to maximize the effect of what we were doing, we want we changed that to environmental care, and that was that's now more sustainable. So it's not just cleaning the streets; it's thinking about how can we sustain clean streets. What do we need to go and speak to the councils? Do we need to uh, and just taking care of the environment in general? Um, we just as our communities have a response we have a responsibility um to towards our communities we also have a, a responsibility towards our towards the environment we are stewards on this earth after all and as we probably we all probably know like global warming is such um has has really taken a toll on the planet um you know and it's all due to human action and and what we have, we are doing and we need to not just stop what we've stopped the, the process and stopped exacerbating it, but we need to almost try and reverse the process. Um, and so we have environmental care and, and it includes not just not just cleaning the streets, we can, but it can be things like turning your masjid into an eco-friendly masjid, that's just an idea. Um, planting trees uh, where, where areas, in areas that where there's been a lot of deforestation, um, helping, I don't know, in areas where, where, where wildlife um, has been affected by human action, um, you know, volunteering with those organizations trying to, to help reverse the effects over there. Um, so we have, that's our second act. Um, there's also donating blood where we, which has remained the same, uh, where we encourage people to donate blood. Um, uh, a lot of, I'm sure we all know that there, there isn't, we need a lot more blood donations from BAME communities. Um, and so we encourage, uh, we are like pushing people to donate blood and with, with COVID, um, it's difficult for us to donate in groups. However, we we are asking people if like this is this goes back to uh, again maybe you're not able to goes back to um, not underestimating like the smallest of, of things that you can do. So not everyone is able to have group don't uh, we're not able to have um, group blood donation sessions. But what you can do is you can, for example, create infographics. You can um, spread awareness through just, you know, um, posters or, or ask or just sharing a link, anything like that. We're asking people to do all of that. Um, and then there's a creative act of good, which um, can be literally anything that will help meet the, the object, uh, objectives of the campaign, which I mentioned before. Um, I don't know how much time I have left. You have no, no seconds no left. No time. Afraid, but uh, yeah, maybe one last sentence before we wrap up, inshallah, go on. Um, Okay, let me think. I think the only the only thing I want to say is um, we have to remember that a lot of these the people that we are helping, um, the things that we are doing, it's you know we we need those people. It may seem like those, for example, those homeless people need us, need our money, need our food. It's not like that. It's it's the other way around. We need them. We need those opportunities to do good, um, to to gain hasanat. Um, and you know, the, sorry, no so we, yeah, we need um, those opportunities are literally coming and knocking at our door. Um, and, and we need to instead of run away from them, instead of thinking, oh no, not another homeless person, I can't do this. Um, we should be we should be running towards these opportunities just as the Sahaba and the prophets did, um, really actively. And, um, really actively seeking out these opportunities. Yeah. Um, some people are, some people are tested with ease, and some people are tested with hardship. And we need to um, 
really like, yeah, try and help our communities to the best of our ability and not look at it as, as a burden, but look at it as a, as a great opportunity um, to achieve Hassanat. Yeah, very, uh, very poignant points that you make there and, uh, you know, Baj is an example, practical example of putting faith into social action and, and how we can implement some of the things that we've heard today. Final remarks from Brother Omar Salha. Uh, Bushra, and thank you so much, uh, Govan and, and uh, Dr. Hani Al-Banna. Um, your, your words speak so much uh, truth and, and full of wisdom. Uh, and to be honest with you, in terms of uh, final remarks, I would just basically echo what Dr. Hani ha ha has said in his final message, which is uh, almost a manifesto for us to all take away and implement in our daily lives. Um, and be like the, the flower, which ha it gives off a, a nice fragrance, you know, wherever you go. And when someone hears your name or when someone sees you or someone uh, works with you on a, on a project or a campaign or your name comes to their mind, especially now under lockdown, it, it creates that positive feeling and makes you hopeful, reminds you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, we're, we're talking about softening hearts and minds and, and the softest heart this evening here with us is Dr. Hani. You know, of, of, all, the, of all the years that he's, uh, he's been involved in, of all the work that he's been involved in, that he's not talking about, by the way, um, you know, he, he holds that characteristic of the softest of hearts. And, and that is uh, an exemplary, you know, uh, I don't want to say role model because he's a real model. He's not, he's not a role, he's a real model. He's, he's someone who is uh, real in front of us. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve you, Dr. Hani, and uh, to allow us, <laughs> I say this in a selfish dua, to preserve you of much health, but also the opportunity for us to continue to learn from you, continue to sit and listen to you and, and take the, 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 you know, immeasurable wisdom and hikmah you have which you have learned, and you have also been in difficult positions. You know, leadership isn't always just great positions, and you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, almost a, uh, a, a a title for us to hold and and uh, and, and hold, hold on to for many years as almost like sort of achievement. On the contrary, it's actually a massive responsibility, um, and it comes with its challenges, and so. As much as we try to bring different communities together, we can't please everyone, but we have to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can do what we can. Um, and if, you know, being a leader, I know we talked about burning out, etc., but being a leader is a very lonesome place. You know, not everyone in the team is going to wake up three in the morning thinking, I should have done this, this, and this. You know, one of the, one of the joys that I have of working with Dr. Hani at the time of the humanitarian forum is randomly he'll come up to me and say, by the way, we need to do X, Y, and Z. And I know he has a, has, has a busy schedule ahead of him. He's just tra he traveled from abroad and he's about to travel and pack his bag and travel the next day. And we'll probably be just making tea or coffee and finished and sitting down and back to work. And he'll, and he'll say, by the way, we need to do X, Y, and Z. I just remember And I'm like, how did you remember this? You know, how did you, where did this come from? And subhanAllah, like, you know, a lot of the times where I've been in positions where I have to wake up literally two, three in the morning, oh, we forgot to do X, Y, and Z, and this is coming up, and this is constantly on your mind. What needs to, what needs to, what needs to happen? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a lonely space. But the, one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the world will tell you this as well. Like, it's a very lonely space in the beginning. You have to always graft, and and, uh, but it's not lonely because we know Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is always with us, right? And and we don't need anyone else. Right? And that's so important that, okay, maybe we don't have peers or colleagues we can turn to, but only with Allah's tawfiq, we are able to achieve what we have achieved. Only by Allah's tawfiq. This is so important. Yes, we are the volunteers, but only by Allah's tawfiq, we have achieved what we have achieved. And it is only through Allah's mercy that we enter into Jannah. Not because of the deeds that we've done. It's only through Allah's mercy. SubhanAllah. Even, you know, by the way, if you have more deeds, more good deeds than bad deeds, you won't just enter gender. You enter gender based on Allah's mercy, period. That's it. 
And so I would, I would, yeah, I would just end on basically saying anyone here, and I'm sure everyone here, you know, uh, you know, is, is, is in one way or another a student of Dr. Hani, whether it's directly through him or through students who studied under him or worked with him, and we have now taken from them, those are, those are the pioneers who, you know, set up MAB initially and, and other organizations across the UK. It is an opportunity for us to, to, to learn, to, to consult, to, and I think the, big, the biggest challenge, as Dr. Henny mentioned, was the, the culture and, and the philosophy of thinking. You know, I, I'm very hopeful that with this new young generation, that there is that philosophy of thinking that needs to change. And it is slowly changing, but it's a massive, massive task ahead of us. But not needless to say, you know, we are not frightened by huge challenges. We take them on board and, and we wanna, we wanna you know, conquer these challenges as they have been conquered in the past. And I think rightly so as the youth, we turn around and we say, why haven't the elders given us the answers, etc.? They're there to tell us, to teach us uh, values and principles, not to give us answers, right? <laughs> so it's, it's down to us now, it's our challenge now to think of the uh, to think of the uh, the answer to them, I think Dr. Hannah, I know what you, I know why you, I know why you're clapping because I I actually said us the youth and he's probably like saying <laughs> oh, you let that slip in right us the youth, but uh, no barakallahu fiikum I really have I've, I've, I've learned so much from being part of this blessed company, and um, and I, once again you know may Allah subhanahu wa taala preserve you Dr. Hani, um, and uh, keep you safe keep your family safe. And inshallah, this is, you know, we can be part of this new challenge of the philosophy of thinking and you'll be part of that solution with the light of Allah. Ameen. Jazakallah khair, Brother Omar. Jazakumullahu rifatan, Dr. Hani. And uh, may Allah increase you all in, may increase us all in sincerity and humility, Ya Rabbi Alam, and accept all the actions from, from yourself, uh, Dr. Hani, and our speakers and everybody who's attended today. Uh, just to finally wrap up, inshallah, we won't take too much of your time. I know we overran and we started late, so barakallahu feekum for sticking with us. In the last sort of three or four minutes, what we would like to do is, first of all, I'd, I'd just like to say jazakum khair for all of our uh, outstanding speakers tonight. May Allah reward them for, for the knowledge they've passed on to us, and, and I hope you guys have benefited as much as, as I have, and, and truly, inshallah, take away something to implement um, for our communities with Ibnillah. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, this is something that we uh, at MAB will do monthly, and so there will be a monthly webinar, so please look out for another one uh, next month. Uh, I will say that four weeks from today, the 20th of March, uh, is the annual CONFAB, which is a MAB youth event, um, something that's taking place online and would welcome you all to attend. The theme this year will be under broadening horizons, so come along and find out how to see things from other perspectives and how to engage with people broader than the environments that we would normally engage with. Um, and also uh, follow us on our social media platforms, make sure that you keep up with our updates on uh, Facebook and Instagram for both the youth department and the MAB uh, central department as well. Just to close as well, uh, Sister Raghad, if you are with us, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, I will spotlight you. Whoops, have I muted myself? No, I haven't. Um, I will spot, uh, spotlight you so you can uh, address our attendees. And Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters. <clears throat> I don't have much to add uh, to the profound uh, lessons and words that came out of this uh, amazing uh, lecture. Um, I think this platform proved something very important uh, that MAP has been working on, which is bringing generations together, gapping, uh, filling that gap between the generations. And today, just by having Dr. Hani with all his expertise and, and the young people, Govan and Umar and Bushra on board means a lot. And I think um, what we wanted to achieve, and if I go back to my youth, two things were prominent in my mind. Um, we, uh, the sister section was totally separate than the brothers sections and there was, it was a dream for a sister to lead uh, a work uh, that uh, covers both brothers and sisters and to me in my 20s, it was something that I was thinking how will I ever conquer and subhanallah now I see you all eloquent young men and women working alongside each other, 
working on different platforms along different organizations, bringing benefit to all, to the Muslim community and to wider society as well. Something that I think I'm living my dream and something that we have achieved and we will continue to strive in MAB and hopefully push other organizations to continue this amazing work and to continue to see young people coming onto the platform, uh, platforms of the older generation. And I can tell you there are some asati that amongst us, both men and women, maybe the ages of your grandparents, or, uh, pa sorry, parents and maybe grandparents uh, who are listening to you. And I'm sure really, really filled uh, with the, you know, so proud of you. So proud of the achievements that we have amongst our youth. Jazakumullah khairan. These two things that I just wanted to highlight. And this platform is exactly what it is for, to bring out the beautiful gems that we have within MAB, within our Muslim community, with the, all the organizations that we work alongside with. So Jazakumullah khair for a beautiful uh, night. And we do apologize for the technical difficulty, but mashallah, you worked well with it and we found an alternative. And inshallah, the recording will be available for everyone who asked about it. And inshallah, this will be a monthly thing where we meet amazing people every single time. Jazakumullah khair. And uh, that is it from me. Thank you. Barakallah, thank you, Sister Agha. Jazakallah khair. May Allah give you the tools and the, and the ability to uh, successfully lead as you have so far this amazing work and inshallah leave a legacy behind for all of us to follow. But mm -hmm. uh, so we will just close as our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, the beloved taught us to Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wal-Asr inna al-insana lafi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu wa amidu al-salihati wa tawasaw bil-haqqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr Subhanakallah wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk and inshallah until next time take care of yourselves and stay safe assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi